a brand new episode of the Happy Productive Podcast is about to begin. It's time to be inspired by simple and actionable solutions for you and your business. If you're an established entrepreneur or just laying down the first brick of your future empire, the mantra is the same. We will flip any failure into a positive and use it to our advantage. This show is all about turning coal into diamonds. With the right plan and mindset, anything is possible. I'm Jennifer John, your host, business coach, and founder of Best Planner Ever. And I'm here to help you achieve all your ambitious goals. Success is closer than you think. Let's do this. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of the Happy Productive Podcast. Buckle up. I think this one is going to be a great one. I have a special guest today, Jeffrey Hazlett. He is a primetime television host, a global business celebrity, speaker, best-selling author, and chairman and CEO of the C-Suite Network. And Okay, as if that wasn't amazing enough, he is also a public speaker, a former Fortune 100 CMO, an author of not one, not two, not three, but four, you guys, four best-selling books, including Think Big, Act Bigger, and The Hero Factor, How Great Leaders Transform Organizations and Create Winning Cultures. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I am super excited to have you here. And you know, one of the things that I know you talk a lot about is hard work. (laughs) And I want to talk about hard work for a second, because I know a lot of business owners, we do work hard. I think there's some business owners out there that don't work hard. And talk to us a little bit about like, the right kind of hard work and what that looks like. Well, I, it, hard work is always the tough thing to do. If it was easy, everybody would do it. Not everybody that's successful is going to do the kind of work that you have to do. It, really, what you want to do is be always focusing on what problem you're solving, right? I mean, if, if you're really getting to the core root of the problem you're solving for somebody else, it makes it a lot easier. Even though the work might be hard, it just makes it easier. The other piece of it that I always like to focus on are what I call conditions of satisfaction or mutual conditions of satisfaction if you're working with somebody else. But what are what are you trying to drive for yourself? What are the key things that drive you every single day? You know, for me, I have three simple ones. I like to build wealth. I want to make sure my family's living in a different way than when I was growing up. And I want them to move forward in a different way, especially my granddaughters that I have. You know, I want to make sure that they're set up for a a better future than I started with. And then I also want to, you know, learn new things. That's my second condition of satisfaction. So I'm always striving to learn. You know, I'm one of those readers, one of those watchers, one of those listeners all the time. But I want to make sure that I'm learning new things in the business. And, you know, I kind of tell everybody I'm a, a, a millennial trapped in a baby boomer's body. You know, that's the way I kind of describe it. So and then last but not least, I want to have fun. You know, I want to do things that are fun. And if they're not fun, even if they're hard work, they got to be fun. Right. You can still have do hard work, but make it fun. You know, like I like to mow grass out of my tractor on my property that I have. I, and I've got a lot of property and I like to, you know, I call it my ranch, although it's not really a ranch, it's only about 48 acres. But nonetheless, you know, I like to get out there on the tractor and do things. It's hard. I have to cut trees, do all that stuff, but it's also a lot of fun too. It's so true. We have horses and there was just a, an upset at our barn with some barn drama. And we went from they're taking care of the horses to now we need to do self care. But it's totally fine with me because there's just something about, you know, hauling the water and throwing the hay and just getting out there working with your hands. I don't know. There's just something about it that's so grounding. And I, abs- I actually absolutely love it. Well, shoveling a few horse uh, muffins doesn't hurt anybody in life. I mean, it'll do it from time <laughs> to time. Know. I started my son out when he was a teenager. I, I got we got him a job at a, a horse stables, and I thought that was one of the best jobs he could probably have. But for a 16 year old to be shoveling horse, you know what? Uh, that's a good thing to do. You, you you learn out very quickly what you don't want to do in life when you're doing that. It's so true. This summer, my daughter spent a week at the must a Mustang sanctuary where they rescue Mustangs, and so she spent the entire week. And I, I thought she thought she was just going to get to like be the with the horses all day, and they put her to work. <laughs> she when we picked her up at the end of the week, she's fixing fences, she's you know hauling manure, she's just like doing all this stuff, and it was amazing to actually see her like get out there and work so hard when we can hardly get her to do the dishes. But it was just uh, this week of crazy work, but it's so good for them. 
Exactly. It's good stuff. Yes. So when do you feel like, you know, working hard in your business starts to, or maybe it never does, but when does it start to maybe take a toll or be like, hey, wait, I, I maybe shouldn't be working quite this hard because I'm actually hurting my business? Like, where do you see that play in? Well, you got to have balance and everything. I think, I think Stephen Covey, uh, years ago, my good friend, I was on stages with him for years. And, you know, he used to say that you have to have a balance in life. You have to have a spiritual side. You have to have friends. You have to have family. You have to have business. And you have to, like a four-way teeter-totter, you have to balance those things. And when one gets out of whack, it throws the other ones off. So you've got to learn to be able as an entrepreneur, as a business leader, executive, you know, our our job is not to be the, the most smartest person in the room, but be most strategic. And so with that, you have to realize that there's got to be some balance. And it's tough. Listen, as an entrepreneur, as a person, you know, I bought and sold over 250 businesses in my career, 25 billion in transactions, uh, spent 200 you know days on the road. You know, last night when I stepped on a plane, uh, one of the flight attendants thanked me for my 5 million miles on that airline. Now, I, you know, that's, that's on one airline. That, I got 2 million on another one and a million on another. And that doesn't count the corporate miles that I used to spend in my own private jets. So, you know, uh, you just learn to have to have that balance. And what the, you know, again, but getting back to those conditions of satisfaction I mentioned a few minutes ago, you really have to have a good sense of, of who you are, what you are, where you want to go and what you want to do. And if you have that, then it makes those decisions a lot simpler. It makes everything a lot simpler by having a clear direction on what you're trying to, you know, to do, to solve and where you want to be when you grow up. Yeah, absolutely. With this massive success that you've had in your life, who was instrumental for you in helping you to, you know, make transformation or change things that maybe you were doing before that weren't working? Who was inspirational for you? Well, they're every day. I run into them every day, whether it's my assistant, Marilyn. Sometimes we butt heads, but there are other times that we have great, great breakthroughs and things that we do. I mean, we find inspiration in all the things that we do. You know, the people that make the most impact on my life are people that you'll never know of. It's the Harold Jones, a former Marine Marine gunner sergeant who kind of adopted me when I was 14, when my father was over in Vietnam and, and made sure that I didn't get into trouble. It was Mr. Penson who gave me a job when I was 16 years old, you know, and worked as a plumber's assistant. So I had some money so I could join a hunting camp. You know, it was uh, Michael Connors in the world who sold me a business and then taught me how to do a Z out on a cash register and measure profits every day. Or John Timmer, former insurance man, who was also a state legislator who did things for the right reasons and sometimes in very unpopular things, you know, uh, it could have been a lot easier for him. But he was based on values. I mean, these are people that most people wouldn't know. But I find inspiration, you know, every day I, I was in the in the Las Vegas airport today and watched a woman who worked at Miami subs there in the decon course and how she upsold people. As I sit down at the table, you know, by the front counter, I'm just impressed. You know, you see hustlers like that, you know, and, and those are the, fi- the folks I find inspiration every single day. I love that so much. And, and, and I like how you named people that probably nobody has heard of, and yet they still had an impact on you. And I think that's a testament that we can have in our own world, in our own little businesses, whatever that looks like, that we can have an impact on the world just by acting with integrity and, and being who we are. Yeah, I, uh, this weekend I was down and I was going through the airport, ran into a friend of mine who's also an actor and hadn't seen him in four or five years because of COVID. And he was telling me about his new motion picture film. He said, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to go say goodbye to my stepfather, who my stepfather's uh, been around for about 40, 45 years of my life. And I hadn't seen him for since last year, and he's in the he's de- 96 years old, declining. So I got to go see him uh, because he's declining, and I want to make sure he knows how important he was in our lives. And so and he said, "Oh, well, you're going to Sarasota. Why don't you go see our friend Joe DiMaggio Jr.?" I said, "Joe's living down there. I thought he was up in New York. Now nah, he's living in, in, in Sarasota. He's got a restaurant. Boom, you know." And I uh, so I went and saw my 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 stepfather. Spent as much time as I could with him before he crashed because at, at 96, and when you're and you're at the advanced stages of, of death, with, which is just to be real blunt about it, you don't have a lot of energy. So I decided that, you know, I was going to go have a scotch, relax, you know, kind of sit back and reflect on those days, all the things that Gene taught me, which was many about business, about property, about a lot of different things, just a good man. 
And then even though he's not my not blood, as some might say, you know, here he was, was a good man. He, he was as much my father as any man was. And so and then I went over and saw Joe and I ran into Joe, who's who owns a string of restaurants all over the country. Yet he's back behind the chef's table cooking. And oh, it, it no. took the time to come over, see me, give me a big hug. We talked for a few minutes. Then he had to go, said, I got to go back behind the thing. He said, are you going to eat? I said, yes, I'm going to eat. He goes, let me pick you out. Would you mind if I order for me? And then he picked me out three dishes, the best dishes in the world, and then come over and brought me this wonderful dessert that he says was his grandmother's recipe with a fork and said, please eat this. And I was stuffed by the time I got out of there. But what, a, what an inspiration. What a, what a great time to see somebody who loves what they do. And being there every single day, the place was packed. You couldn't get a table. I had to belly up to the bar, which was great, because that's where I love to sit anyway. And uh, and I got to talk to the employees. I got to talk to other patrons that were there and just have a great time and be inspired. Wow. Uh, that's so funny. That's so cool. So what would you say to a business owner? That, let's say they're just kind of mired. They're buried in the day-to-day. -day. In fact, it's hard to kind of see that light at the end of the tunnel. They're not feeling super inspired. Like, what would you say to them to kind of help them to step into a higher place where they can actually work with more inspiration in their day-to-day? -day? Well, the only person that's going to change it for you is the person that's looking in the mirror at you every day. That's it. It's not your accountant, not your attorney, not your banker, uh, not your mom, okay? It's you. Every single day, the person that's responsible for you is you. And that person looks at you in the mirror, in the mirror every day. I call that the mirror test. And you have to do that every day. Find out whether your business is breathing and what you need to do, right? The other thing is set some rules, set some parameters, do some time blocks, do some other things to set and say, what are the most important things that I've got to do today? You know, I you know I live in South Dakota, New York, uh, Miami, L.A. We have Austin, L.A., San Francisco, everywhere, Pittsburgh. And people always say, why do you live in Sioux Falls? And I finally said, because I can. You know, and, yeah. and that you just have to have an attitude that says that's what it's going to be, because I can. You can control your destiny every single day. You decide what's on your calendar. You decide what, what your priorities are. You decide whether somebody's going to suck up your day or time and waste your efforts every day. So, you know, I try to automate, delegate, eliminate. I sit down and look at the list. What's the most important things that I have to get out and done today? There's a lot of important things. I probably have on my Monday list 180 things to do over the next couple of days. But only the two biggest things I had to do was get out two sets of letters to invite people to join me in Cabo, San Lucas, for the first week of October. So I needed to get those letters out so I could get those registrations done and get people. So you put priorities, you change them. And that's what you need to be able to understand. But automate, delegate, eliminate every day. Go through that list. What can I get rid of? What can I just delete off my plate? What can I automate, you know, or what can I delegate to others? And so, you know, I, for years, I wasn't doing that. I wasn't as effective. And I was down in the dumps about things. So I decided, hey, I'm the one that can change it, make a difference, right? And that's what you have to look at. You understand that as a business leader, you're going to fail and you're going to fail often. That's the nature of the deal. Everybody does that. Everybody asks me in these interviews, what's your biggest failure? You, Jennifer, you might be going to ask me that a little bit later. Let's just cut through it. I don't know. I haven't done it yet, which what I mean is there's always going to be one that's bigger. And so it's not about failing fast. It's about winning fast. And that's what you have to get in that frame of mind. You know, it wasn't too long ago I was doing an event for uh, one of the biggest uh, talent agencies in the world. And they had some major, major, major players in that room. And they asked me to come and talk about marketing uh, on a big macro level as former chief marketing officer, you know, one of the biggest marketers out there. They said, would you come and talk about building the brand of you? How do these movie stars build their own brands? And so in that room was some of the biggest players in Hollywood you've ever seen. And so, in fact, one of them asked me a question. This was what he said. And by the way, you would know who this is. I'd give you three guesses and you would be able to guess it within three guesses. One of the biggest blockbuster stars there is. And he said, Jeff, what do you do about those little voices in your head every day? I said, what voices? He said, you know, those voices that tell you you're an imposter. You're not good enough. You, you can't do it. I said, oh, I stopped inviting those voices to my conversations a long time ago. You know, and so that's what we have to do. We have to make a decision. That doesn't mean that they haven't been there, that they won't be there, that they pop up. I just stopped listening to them a long time ago. And so that's what we have to do. So, you know, get in the right frame of mind. You're the only one that's responsible for, for you. So get 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 off your keister, get up, get off off your, your couch and quit eating bonbons and feeling sorry for yourself and get in the game. 
Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. Was there a time in business that you learned a really important lesson, but maybe it came disguised as something like horrible that was happening? <laughs> it seemed like a horrible thing. Every day. What are you talking about? Out. Every, every day, day. <laughs> every day, something pops up. But you know, but I've had those big ones. I mean, like you know, I tried to corner the market on pheasants, you know, one time until I found out there wasn't <laughs> one. Right? I lost my rear end. I had ten thousand pheasants look up into the sky one night when it was raining, and there's like three inches of rain in half an hour. And they, you know, if you know anything about pheasants, they look up the sky, they open their beaks, and they drown. They're the stupidest freaking birds in the face of the earth. You know, so yeah, I I had a pony up back then. It was like five grand overnight. I had to write a check for five thousand dollars to keep the place going, and like I didn't have five thousand dollars. Of course, that was terrible. It was catastrophic. You know, what did I do? Why did I do this? You know, I again tried to corner the market. And there wasn't one. Okay, great. You know, lesson learned. So, you know, so there, there there's something like that happens absolutely every day. If I had people who've come to me and said back out, or let's take COVID for example, I was having a major conference in. In uh, Norfolk, Virginia, we rented out the USS Wisconsin, the entire battleship. I had, was going to have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people going to come, and COVID hit. And then all the deposits had to refund them all, send the money back, all that kind of stuff. Hotel didn't ask for, wouldn't give me a refund, you know, none of that. Uh, the USS Wisconsin didn't give me a refund, gave me a little bit, which was kind of nice of them. But most of the others, no, no, no. I had to pay everybody. Well, turn it on to an online event, had 3,500 instead of 350 people come. So there's a, wow. you, know, you can make a little little lemonade out of some lemons. So, it, but nonetheless, it's still tough to do. You know, a lot of effort wasted. Well, but that in the end, no one died. You know, no one died. And pheasants died, but no people died. So yeah. Yeah, exactly. COVID was so interesting because I feel like we have an internal joke. We call it the gift that keeps on giving because there was just so many things that happened as COVID being the catalyst. No disrespect to anybody who did actually die in COVID yeah. Yeah, and the were. poor pheasants. Yeah. yeah, but, you know, it was interesting to me to watch all of our clients um, and the ones who pivoted. And actually, many of them ended up where at the beginning of the year when it started, they thought they were going to lose their businesses. And they actually finished the year with record breaking profits because they did. They pivoted, they didn't let it beat them. And it's just amazing to me that resiliency that you see not in all business owners, but in a lot of business owners where it's just, you know, being able to take something difficult, challenging, uh-oh, and then actually turn it into something that has a better outcome and a better ending. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it, well, resourcefulness in terms of doing it, not all businesses thrive, not all businesses survive. Many went beyond that, you know, and did well. I, I remember a good one of our Hero Club members in the C-Suite Network, she started a business on Friday the 13th, the restaurant business, a whiskey and burger bar on that very day that they shut everything down, just down the road from me there in New York, in New York near West Point. And yet she's thriving and doing great. She did more than survive, you know, and that was our message to a lot of our C-suite network isn't, isn't about just survive. And that doesn't do you any good just to survive. I know lots of people who were military or, you know, fought in wars and they survived, but they didn't thrive. And so, you know, yeah. that, that, that's, there's a big difference. And I, you know, back then I said to everybody, I said, look, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I don't even have a soul mask. Uh, but what I am is a business first responder. So what do we have to do for everybody? What do we need to do for each other in order to make sure that we not only, you know, survive, but we thrive and we drive and we move through this so we can make you in better shape than you were. And it wasn't easy. Um, you know, I don't wish it on anybody. Will we have those times again? Yes. Will we have the draconian, what I might call draconian efforts of, of shutting down businesses? That will not, I don't think that will ever happen to the extent that it happened this last time, because I just, my, most people won't put up with it. And I also think we'll find ways around it. And that's what's most important is that we we learn to know, you know, we could do things different. We could do it remote. We could do things with on Zoom or on uh, meetings, video meetings. We could do it in different ways and we could still, you know, make money. Uh, we could we could not just survive, we could thrive. We could actually increase. And during, look, at even during the recession, as we start talking about this recession, there's lots of people who have done well during the downturns. I mean, Airbnb was founded during the last 2008. Uh, Uber was founded. Like, who would have thought, you know, 20 years ago or 15 years ago that you would put your daughter in a car at 2 a.m. after she's been out drinking with somebody she doesn't know? 
you know, who would have thought that, you know, uh, in 2008, that somebody would invent a business that they would, you would welcome them in your house. They would sit naked on your couch and they'd pay you money for it. I mean, it's just nuts to think about <laughs> things like that. And yet here we are, here's what we're doing. And, the, you know, billion dollar businesses, unicorns, unicorns are born. The same thing in back in the seventies, Microsoft, Apple was born, uh, go further back. GM was born. HP was born in 1936. I mean, all of these businesses that were during, you know, some of the worst economic conditions in the world were born and not only born, still some of the biggest companies today. So it can be done. Uh, are you just, are you the one to do it? Yeah, absolutely. I oh, love it so much. It's so funny. We just had an Airbnb and you just made me think of like who else was sitting naked on this couch. Yeah, and there you go. I'm like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> but it really is an amazing thing to think that you can you can now like, you know, yeah. rent somebody's house. And we just did. We We were just there. And it was like, yeah. You're right. We're like inside somebody else's space, but it was great. I loved it because it felt like home. It didn't feel like a hotel and yeah. we didn't want to feel like we were in a hotel. We wanted to feel like we were away from home. So Good it for you. amazing. I'm staying, in a, I'm staying in a hotel. That's what I'm doing. I'm staying in a hotel. <laughs> Not a problem. I have no issue or a cabin that no one else has been to for a long time that, or way out in the wild. <laughs> I, that, that I could a teepee maybe or a tent. I can do that. Yeah enjoy that. Yeah, yeah, I know. We love that too. We just took our first 10 day motorcycle trip. I learned how to ride a motorcycle in the last couple months. I've been on the back of my husband's bike. So we went out for 10 days. I was too chicken to, to camp on the first time 10 days on the bike. I'm like, I need like a room and a hot shower at the end of every day. Next time I'll, I'll, I'll do the 10 thing. Go. I'm like, all right, next time I feel like I can handle tents with this, maybe not every night, but yeah, it was, come out it was to South great. Dakota. Come, come on out to the Black Hills for Sturges. You got to come out for the Sturges bike rally. That's the only time that everybody mm. in South Dakota leaves the state and lets everybody else come in <laughs> and just say, "Hey, when you when you when you're done, turn the lights off, and we'll be back the day after." Because uh, literally, our our state population doubles. Most South Dakotans try to get out of get out of the state when all the bikers are coming in. That's what everybody is telling me. They're like, Jen, you need to do Sturgis. I'm like, okay, maybe I'll put that on my radar. We we just rode from New York up through Vermont, all across Maine, Man. down to New Hampshire and, New, and uh, back to New York. But now I'm like, all right, I did 10 days. I loved it. I'm ready to do, we want to do like a month. We'll go from New York all the way out West. So we'll stop and say hi, Jeff. And, uh, you bet. Well, they get, get there, see the Black Hills, Mount Rushmore, Crazy Horse Memorial, and of course, that's uh, the one we want to see is Crazy Horse. Yeah, yeah. They're, yeah though they're good friends, Yad, Yad Viga and the and her sisters and brothers and and now nieces and nephew all run it, and uh, you get a chance to uh, now the whole family. It's a seventy five year old startup is what it has been owned by the family, run by the family, and uh, they've done a good job. They climb up on that mountain, blow rocks off of it, you know, chisel away on it. They're still making progress, and you get to walk out on the arm if you're if if you treat them nice, they'll let you walk out on. Crazy Horse's arm, which is, you know, like 10, 20 or 50 times bigger than Mount Rushmore. And it's just massive. Just the fingernail on the end of his outstretched arm is 11 feet across. So just to give you an idea, scope of uh, scale of that, it's just massive. But go see the Wildlife Loop and Custer. We love people to come. Don't get off your bike and don't ride through the buffalo hurts because every year we get somebody that gets hurt. They think those buffalo are nice big cows, but they're wild. So. They are wild. They are wild. I was born in Arizona and grew up out West and um, lived in Montana. And there's a lot of Buffalo there. And you learned like, it's like, no guys, these are wild animals. Yeah. Like don't yeah. treat them like cows. Yeah. Well, there's this thing, yeah. Or, or bears. There's this saying, you know, what, what doesn't hurt you will make you stronger except bears. Bears will kill you. Bears will kill you. So bears will just kill you. Yes. <laughs> well, last year, this is one of the greatest things in Sturgis. We, there's now t-shirts here. Come visit South Dakota. And I can't remember where, uh, and, 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 but don't pet the buffalo. And it's got a picture of a, a buffalo because a woman uh, went up to the buffalo and one of the buffaloes go gored her, but grabbed her by the jeans, ripped her jeans off of her. And those, those jeans were hanging on that buffalo for like a week and a half. And uh, it was crazy. You'd see that buffalo out in the middle of the prairie with a pair of jeans on its horn. So. A pair of jeans. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. <laughs> that is crazy. Oh, my gosh. I love it. I love it. So funny. So funny. Oh, yeah. It's, that's what it said. It said we've been but we've been bison have been buffalo or been tossing tourists since 1889. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> very nice. Very nice. Well, we will definitely have to put that on our itinerary when we make our, our little cross country journey on the bikes. I love it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here with me today. Is there one piece of information or just one final thought you'd love to leave with our listeners today? Well, I think the biggest thing for most people right now is just to focus in on what problem you're solving. I said that and I'm going to do it. That's what I do every single day. The more that we focus on that, the more we focus and say, oh, we're this or we're that. No, no, no. Focus on the problem you're solving for somebody. And if you can solve problems for somebody, they'll pay you. And that's the most important thing that we can think of or should be thinking of every day in our business. Yeah, I agree completely. Jeff, if people want to learn more about you and all your amazingness, where can they go to find you? Well, if they're watching, they can certainly go to my email right there, jeffrey.hazlett, J-E-F-F-R-E-Y dot H-A-Y-Z-L-E-T-T at c-suite network.com, c hyphen suite, S-U-I-T-E network.com. Or you can find me on social media. I've got a million followers all over the place. So you can find me on every social media there is. You, you direct message me, I'll get back to you. Very nice. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Wonderful insight and wisdom that I know you're leaving everybody with. And that's it, you guys. Get out there and have a great, happy, productive day. Bye, y'all. I hope you found today's episode of the Happy Productive Podcast inspiring. Every successful business is formed by a set of small, consistent, and attainable steps. If you want to learn more, come visit us at jenniferdawncoaching.com to take your next step and learn how to meet your business goals. On our website, you're going to find free resources along with links to the life-changing coaching programs that have transformed the lives of so many of our clients, including the Coaching Academy and our Unbreakable Retreats. Many of them started their journey by listening to this podcast podcast. That's it. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for our next episode.